Armstrong sang it so well, What a Wonderful World. And every day I thank uh, my lucky stars that I'm alive on this world and I have the consciousness to experience and explore nature's wonders and mysteries on a daily basis. But most of us know, to a lesser or greater extent, that the planet is ailing. When I was a young boy, I was inspired by my grandfather, who was a remarkable surgeon and uh, family physician. And he was quite uh, renowned for being able to heal people who were very sick and their body systems were breaking down. And I thought, well, one day I want to do the same thing. But it was also the same decades that we had our first views of Earth from outer space that kind of raised our planetary consciousness. And I also came under the spell of that remarkable undersea adventure explorer, Jacques Cousteau, who kind of gave us our planetary ecological consciousness. So I decided not to become a surgeon and a family physician, but a planetary physician practicing preventive medicine. And I want to cover very quickly the declining health of our planet, which is, I think, more serious than most people realize, as well as to share with you some of the planetary solutions that are larger and easier than most people think. And then I want to close with just a few moments of what we all, anywhere on the planet at any time, engage in accelerating the healthiness that can reverse the declining health of the planet. Now when you take a look at a picture like this, a doctor sees sickness, disease, cancer, accelerated deaths. An economist will shrug his shoulders and basically say that's the price of progress. I look at it and I see blockage, almost like a, a hardening of the arteries, preventing innovation. And for those places on the planet, Singapore, Europe, North America, who have cleaned up the, this pollution and smog, it's resulted in phenomenal health benefits. In the United States alone, over the first 25 years of setting very rigorous standards and enforcing them, there was such a wave of innovation that it has generated $20 trillion in health benefits and improved productivity of the forests and lakes and croplands. So it's not an either or, either progress or pollution. It's actually a matter of innovation. And the problem is, while that is solvable, the one area that leaders worldwide seem to be fiddling while the whole planet is burning has to do with that uh, greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide. It's responsible, for example, for a fifth of all the coral reefs in the world already dead, this graveyard here. But even more insidiously than raising the temperature, the fever of the planet, is that it's actually causing acidosis of our ocean. Now, just like the human blood system, the oceans are the planet's blood system. And acidosis is when your pH of your blood system begins to drop. And if it drops below a certain level, then acidemia occurs. And acidemia causes shock, uh, and seizures, you go into a coma, and you eventually die. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the oceans. We have not witnessed this level of acidification in 300 million years. And during my lifetime, we've already seen 40% of the ocean's phytoplankton uh, reduced, the base of the food chain. Scientists basically say there's only one solution, and that's to stop burning fossil fuels and stop burning biomass, mainly tropical forests. Now, it's not only driving the extinction of ocean animals, it's also driving the extinction of land animals. Now these charismatic species in this image are all extinct forever, irreversible. And extinction has always been a part of, human, uh, of, of history, but unfortunately humans have accelerated the extinction rate on the planet a thousand fold. And over this century, with the amount of greenhouse gases that we'll be putting in the atmosphere, we're basically going to drive over half of all species extinct. And there's only been like half a dozen major species extinction specimens in the history of the planet. And the overwhelming number are due to these mega volcanic eruptions. 
Humans are basically now playing the role of a mega volcanic eruption. But again, it's only stopping the emissions that's going to prevent it. Now, if you look at coal, which is responsible for nearly half of the uh, CO2 emissions, and generates about half the power that we use, you can see that every time somebody flips on a light switch for their cooling or refrigeration or lights, that they're actually getting with them a whole chemical pool of contaminants, neurotoxins and heart, uh, heavy metals. Uh, the, I would say that the one big uh, elephant in the room that would fill this entire room is the fact that economists still say that coal is too cheap not to use. Well, that's far from the truth. In fact, a, a Harvard Medical School-led report recently indicated that if we were to factor in all the costs that we incur from lung cancer and mercury in the brain and other assaults because of the use of coal, that the price of coal would be 600% higher than it currently is. It would be priced out of the market because there's so many other cleaner, cheaper alternatives. So the big question arises, how can we flip the switch? How can we get our utilities to finance zero-foot utility services? And this is, a, is not a new question. In fact, we have 30 years of experience by leading uh, innovators like the state of California, which has shown that it's really just modifications of existing utility rules with new proven rules that can drive extraordinary benefits. What it involves is, first of all, inventorying all your options for delivering services. And this means going beyond just figuring out whether that's a fossil fuel plant, a nuclear power plant, or a renewable energy system. It also means looking at all of the customer side ways that we use energy and water. Why is that? It's because we're right in the midst of a knowledge innovation that is resulting in radically innovating every energy and water consuming device that we have. Just in this room alone, if you look overhead or look at these floodlights, they're LED, it's one of the most remarkable innovations in recent times. So you want to inventory all those opportunities for using knowledge to deliver services in a cleaner, cheaper way. Second, you need to rank or prioritize, prioritize these opportunities so that they can compete with the supply options on what is the least cost and the least risk opportunities. And it's turned out in California that the end use efficiency improvements are five times cheaper than expanding any supply for operating inefficient devices. And finally, use the utilities finance to finance those end use efficiency improvements. They shouldn't leave it to all of us to figure out what to invest in, what technology works, and then come up with those front-end capital costs. We, as utility, monthly utility bill players, payers, basically finance new power construction. And the question is, why aren't we financing the efficiency of our own buildings and factories and all the devices inside so that our utility bills actually go down instead of going up, and they go down while the emissions also go down? So I want to put this in the context, because these are huge numbers of what the opportunities are. For the last four years, we've been in the midst of a global financial crisis, as we all know. That crisis in one year collapsed $35 trillion in economic value. It also required another $20 trillion of bailouts to prevent uh, even worse uh, meltdown. It threw over 20 million middle-class people out of jobs and another 200 million people back into poverty. These are huge numbers. And so in this context, changing those utility rules will achieve $45 trillion in savings within the next 20 years. That includes reduced utility bills, reduced tax bills for the subsidies that we currently give, $600 billion a year that we give to the fossil fuel industry. And it also reduces the social costs, the mercury that uh, is a neurotoxin. But it also would generate multi-hundred million jobs in our communities as we begin to green our buildings and our factories and all the devices therein. So let me just quickly run through a couple of examples. Uh, first of all, there are 13 billion incandescent bulbs in the world. Replacing those with now the LED bulbs like what we see in this room would achieve a six-fold reduction, not only in the several thousand power plants currently needed to power those incandescents, or the 34 billion rail cars of coal that they burn in those plants, but also several billion dollars a year of savings on our uh, utility bills. 
Or take the fact that we could create a world of solar reflecting cities. And this building is a classic example. It's got a white roof which reflects the heat away so you don't have to run the air conditioning so much. Now each square meter of white roof offsets one ton of CO2. So within the next year, we could paint basically all the roofs, or most of the roofs, in our cities around the world, which would result in $2 trillion worth of savings, and it would offset the global emissions for two entire years. Electric motors, it's the engine of economic growth. Turns out that 8% of all new motors and box compressors will be installed in the coming decades. And we now, with our knowledge-intensive designs, have made ultra-efficient motors that can deliver the same power, but with 50% less energy and 90% savings. Do this worldwide, and again, you get multi-trillion dollar savings. We can also look at zero-emission mobility. We are radically innovating the way that we can electrify our vehicles. And there are already 150 million electric bikes uh, being operated. Why? Because at a dollar a liter of uh, fuel cost, the uh, average cost in the world, is now more cost effective to use uh, solar powered electric vehicles. I would suggest that we ought to get the $600 billion that we spend on fossil fuel subsidies to finance with several billion uh, 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 solar powered vehicles, not just electric bicycles, but there's a whole Cambrian explosion of innovations going on by small and medium sized businesses around the world. With ultra light vehicles, you no longer have to build these in big multi billion dollar factories, you can build these in small units. And so we're going to see a lot of speciation and innovation. When I talk about being solar powered, I think the one myth propagated by the fossil fuel industry is that it would take an enormous amount of area to provide solar power for the world. Quite the contrary, in fact, it would take about 15% of existing urban land on rooftops and on ground fields like industrial uh, facilities that have contaminated the land to provide 100% of the global current world production of uh, power. And we have the innovation of software tools to now map out through satellite imagery and aerial imagery exactly where the rooftops are and where the sites are so that a utility can literally set up a queue to provide feed-in tariffs that would allow our cities to begin to move towards solarization. While we make this transition with efficiency in solar, wind already now is the cheapest and the lowest risk and the smallest footprint, the zero footprint opportunity that we have, including coal when you add in a couple of the costs that I talked about earlier. Now, we can only do this so fast, and it, uh, the efficiency and the renewable phase in. And so we're still going to have these fossil-fired power plants. Well, what do we do about those emissions? Well, right now, about 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions are due to burning down tropical forests. That's more than all the entire world's transportation fleet. And what we can do is have those utilities offset their emissions by paying the small-scale farmers not to burn their forests down, but improve the fertility of their soils, get access to clean water and microfinance, so that you move people out of poverty into sustainable livelihoods while protecting nature's ecosystem services and biodiversity, and it becomes an incentive for the utilities to shut those factories, those power plants down faster. So, for example, Walt Disney, which is not waiting for the utilities to actually do this, has transitioned to very efficient operations, moving into renewables, and then they invested $4 million into small communities in the Congo Basin to protect some of the most uh, radically uh, biologically rich areas on the planet. You know, kind of a win-win situation. So how are we going to achieve this? I mean, information, people hear it, they forget it. You have to learn how to act on it, to share it. And thank goodness, we do have an enormous pool of information uh, of time available. As a uh, previous TED talker, Clay Shirky pointed out, humans watch about a trillion hours of television a year. And when six innovators got together and created Wiki 12 years ago, they, had, uh, they were able to tap into 100 million hours of volunteers who invested uh, about 100 million hours. They've created now the largest open source knowledge asset in the world, translated in 250 languages. And that 100 million hours seems like a lot, but it actually was just uh, the amount of TV ads that Americans watch every weekend. So what I'm suggesting is that we can create a planetary medicine practitioner's manual, available to anyone anywhere on the planet to help become a change agent in their local communities to actually begin to move towards a zero footprint uh, society. 
So we need to collaborate, and we have all the tools already available, whether it's learning through YouTube how to actually implement these things, or the, the Google map mashups to find out where things are being done that we can adopt to our local environment, or the conversation that 800 million people are already engaged in through Facebook can begin to con converse about these opportunities. So I propose that we carve out a little slice of that time to create this practitioner's manual. And I just want to leave you with one final comment that most people think, oh, one person, what can I possibly do? Well, I want you to remember that even the mighty, the mighty ocean is made up of single drops of water.